Listen, if you don't mind, I'm not really up for chatting. I'm just going to sit here quietly and let my life flash before my eyes. <laughs> Number five, accurate, Archimedes Eureka moment. Anyway, she takes off all of her clothes, climbs into the hot tub, and the first thing I notice... The water level rose. <laughs> no. Well, of course it did. Yeah, it's said that Archimedes, the ancient Greek mathematician, discovered the principle of displacement while taking a bath. At least Sheldon has his science history down pat. In this season four episode, he invites new friends to the apartment, regaling them with the tale of Archimedes and the Golden Wreath. According to legend, the king of Syracuse wanted to know if the golden wreath he had commissioned was made of pure gold and not cheaper metals. Turning to Archimedes for advice, Archimedes, realizing the water in his bathtub rose the more he sank down, weighed the wreath with both gold and silver, thus proving the wreath was mixed with silver. Forgive me, but I think you'll find my story is more interesting. Does yours have wet breasts in it? <laughs> Better. It has a gold crown. You see, the king wondered how much gold was in it and charged Archimedes with coming up with the solution. Because the crown was irregularly shaped, there was no way to mathematically determine its volume. But while bathing, Archimedes realized he could immerse the crown and measure the amount the water rose. This is in fact an existing legend, and Sheldon's recounting of it is spot on. When he finished, he shouted, Eureka! No, I always shout, holy moly. <laughs> Don't know why, just do. <laughs> All right, that concludes the getting to know you portion of the evening. Too bad his friends failed to appreciate it. So long story short, I nailed her. <laughs> Number five, cringe, Sheldon and the mystery of the glass. I would like to propose a toast to my best friend, Dr. Leonard Hofstadter. <laughs> he has been presented with a wonderful opportunity and I couldn't be happier for him. In this season six episode, Sheldon calls everyone to attention by striking a glass, remarking that the bell-like sound is a B-flat. Um, can I have your attention, everyone? <laughs> That's a B-flat for those who don't have perfect pitch. Remarking that the bell-like sound is a B-flat. It's actually a B. Of course, the actual note the glass can produce varies based on the liquid, the material, and the position of the strike. Sheldon loves to correct people and spout science trivia, so it's satisfying to see that even he gets little things wrong. A person can be a genius in many fields, but not in all of them. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Number four. Accurate, Neil deGrasse Tyson's snubbing of Pluto. Uh, Sheldon, I want you to meet Neil deGrasse Tyson from the Hayden Planetarium in New York. I'm quite familiar with Dr. Tyson. He's responsible for the demotion of Pluto from planetary status. Remember when Pluto was a planet? And when it wasn't a planet? The controversy over Pluto's classification is still undergoing, especially since the IAU demoted it to dwarf planet status in 2006. Pluto so had, why do you think people want to name it a Plu uh, planet? Pluto again? had it coming from the beginning. It was, it was like, it was never really below. Pluto's orbit crosses that of another planet. That's no kind of behavior for a planet. Sheldon, it turns out, is pro-planet Pluto, and when he meets guest star Neil deGrasse Tyson, he makes his position perfectly clear. I liked Pluto. <laughs> Ergo, I do not like you. What makes this hilarious is the fact that Tyson, as director of the Hayden Planetarium, did go against referring to Pluto as the ninth planet. Pluto lovers everywhere were in arms, with Tyson even getting hate mail. And Sheldon, it seems, was another disappointed fan. I actually didn't demote Pluto. That was a vote of the International Astronomical Union. If ifs and buts were candy and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. <laughs> Think about that, Dr. Tyson. Number four, cringe. Howard becoming an astronaut. I got great news. NASA picked my team's design for the deep field space telescope that's going on the International Space Station this spring. In season five, Howard Wolowitz realizes his dream of becoming an astronaut. Howard is an engineer who designs components for satellites and space probes, including space toilets and telescopes. In installing a deep space telescope, Howard is invited by the NASA Johnson Space Center to become an astronaut. Someone has to go up with the telescope as a payload specialist, and guess who that someone is? Muhammad Lee. Is this a plausible turn of events? 
Unfortunately, the answer is no. Howard is not only allergic to peanuts, almonds, and nuts, but has asthma and idiopathic arrhythmia. These health conditions would have prevented him from being able to go to space. Sorry, Howard. Well, I heard you were thinking about going back up to the space station. And as someone who's been there with you, well, you know how astronauts need to have the right stuff? Sure. The stuff you have is wrong. Number three, accurate, Schrodinger's cat. Sheldon, do you have anything to say that has anything to do with, you know, what I'm talking about? Well, let's see. We might consider Schrodinger's cat. We can thank Big Bang Theory for this nifty, pop culture-friendly explanation of this famous thought experiment. While giving Penny and Leonard some relationship advice, Sheldon brings up physicist Erwin Schrodinger's critique of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. Schrodinger. Is that the woman in 2A? No, that's Mrs. Grossinger. And she doesn't have a cat. She has a Mexican hairless, annoying little animal. Yep, yep, Sheldon! <laughs> in his conundrum, the cat is placed in a sealed box with a vial of poison that may or may not be broken. Unless someone opens the box to know for sure, the cat can be said to be both alive and dead. In 1935, Erwin Schrodinger, in an attempt to explain the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, he proposed an experiment where a cat is placed in a box with a sealed vial of poison that will break open at a random time. Now, since no one knows when or if the poison has been released, until the box is opened, the cat can be thought of as both alive and dead. Sheldon's explanation is completely accurate, and his use of it as a metaphor for Penny and Leonard's up-in-the-air relationship is surprisingly insightful. Just like Schrodinger's cat, your potential relationship with Leonard right now can be thought of as both good and bad. It is only by opening the box that you'll find out which it is. Okay, so you're saying I should go out with Leonard. No, 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 no. <laughs> Number three, cringe, Barry Kripke's helium prank. When Sheldon appears on a radio show, his rival Kripke strikes when he pumps helium into the room as a prank. This makes Sheldon's already high tenor positively squeaky. So far, so factual. Now let's talk about magnetic monopoles. Can you explain to our audience just what a monopole is? Of course. First, consider an ordinary magnet, which has, as even the most uneducated in your audience must know, two poles. <clears throat> The problem is that the amount of helium required for that effect to happen would have killed off Sheldon for good. Helium is a simple asphyxiant, and thus would have displaced the amount of oxygen in the room. This would lead to Sheldon suffocating and Kripke getting arrested. Uh, Dr. Cooper, I think there might be something wrong with our connection. Uh, no, I hear you fine. <laughs> As I was saying, an ordinary magnet has two poles. The primary characteristic of a monopole is that it has only one pole, hence monopole. Fortunately, death by helium is rare, making this prank largely harmless to show on TV. A requirement for string theory, or epic theory, if you will, is the existence of monopole. Number two, accurate, Galileo and the Pope's little misunderstanding. Hello, Penny. Get anything good? Uh, just the latest copy of Applied Particle Physics Quarterly. Oh, you know, that is so weird that yours came and mine didn't. This show knows its science history. In this season one episode, Sheldon and Leonard are fighting. Why don't you ever speak to me again. What? When Penny tries to pry, Sheldon retorts with this zinger. So you and Leonard... Oh, dear God. A little misunderstanding, huh? A little misunderstand- Galileo and the Pope had a little misunderstanding. This is a reference to astronomer Galileo Galilei's assertion that the Earth revolves around the Sun. To the displeasure of the Catholic Church at the time, accused of heresy, Galileo was placed under house arrest in 1633, passing away in 1642. The only difference was Pope Urban VIII had been Galileo's patron before turning against him. This, however, makes Sheldon's reference even more apropos, considering he and Leonard's friendship. How do you feel? I don't understand the question. <laughs> I'm just asking if it's difficult to be fighting with your best friend. Oh, I hadn't thought about it like that. I wonder if I've been experiencing physiological manifestations of some sort of unconscious emotional turmoil. Number two, cringe. The theory of super asymmetry. There's something I need to tell you. If 
Wow, you look amazing. Let's talk about Sheldon and Amy's theory of super asymmetry. There is, in fact, no such thing. There is only supersymmetry, which is part of the current theory of subatomic matter. Something incredible just happened. Remember when you were telling me about my bow tie and how a little asymmetry is good? Yeah? My equations have been trying to describe an imperfect world, and the only way to do that is to introduce imperfection into the underlying theory. So instead of supersymmetry, it would be super asymmetry? Super asymmetry, that's it! There are actually 10,000 scientific papers on the theory. So even if the supersymmetry project does come to fruition, it would probably nominate more than two scientists. It's an understandable fictionalization, though, that is indeed close to the actual theory. Also, if the writer's team came up with a plausible and even viable scientific theory for the show, they would probably deserve a Nobel Prize all to itself. Everyone's waiting. What are you guys doing? Super asymmetry. Super asymmetry? Is that a thing? We're inventing it right now. Don't you think this can wait? Number one, accurate. Those whiteboard equations. Someone touched my board. <laughs> Oh God, my board. <laughs> you would think that a TV sitcom would just show any mumbo jumbo scientific equation on a whiteboard, but Big Bang Theory took it a step further, consulting with Dr. David Salzberg, a physics professor at UCLA. Look at the beta function of quantum chromodynamics. The sign's been changed. Uh, yeah. But doesn't that fix the problem you've been having? Are you insane? Are you out of your mind? Are you, hey, look, that fixes the problem I've been having. Not only did he come up with the new equations for every episode, but he also looked over the show's scripts. The writers would leave brackets in the scripts for Salzburg to include scientific references where most fitting. As a result, you get genuine math and scientific equations on the show. It was Salzburg, in fact, who contributed the Galileo and the Pope joke. The merging of science with comedy has never been so harmonious. I guess we don't need this anymore. <sighs> Number one, cringe, the Nobel Prize process. Of course, the show takes liberties with the reality of science as well. In season 12, Sheldon and Amy are in the running to win none other than the Nobel Prize for their work on their theory of super asymmetry. Oh my gosh, it's from Fermilab in Chicago. Ah, not surprising, the windy city. Great flag town. <laughs> no, no, it's about our paper. A team of physicists confirmed super asymmetry. Our paper was right, we did it. The problem is that Sheldon and Amy's paper is too recent to be considered for the prize. It would have to be reviewed first, which takes time. And of course, hundreds of scientists would realistically be working on proving the theory, not just two guys from Fermilab. Also, the Swedish Academy of Sciences, distinguished professors, and previous Nobel laureates are usually the ones to nominate candidates for the prize. Super asymmetry could be the breakthrough that gets us there. But we can't fight over credit. We have to work together. So you're saying that the four of us should just agree to share this discovery? While a Fermilab director may be on the list, the president of Caltech is less likely. If anybody tells you you can't, don't listen. What other Big Bang Theory science tidbit was spot on or just made you cringe? Let us know in the comments. I was humiliated on national radio. How do you think I'm doing? Come on, it wasn't that bad. What do you want? We represent the Lollipop Guild and we want you.